Now we want to greet you again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors. As I said earlier, this kind of weather kind of separates the men from the boys, the girls from uh, the ladies, and the strong soldiers from the weak. So we're glad you're here as a good soldier of the cross, and may God bless you. And we're looking forward to a good hour together. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edwards speaking, and we're hoping this hour that's coming up can be a real inspiration. Now I want you to write in and get these tapes. We'd like to hear from you next week. If this hour is a blessing to you, let us hear from you. Now, we want to get these tape out, if we can. It'll be a blessing to a lot of people. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. So we want to hear from you. Now, if we don't get all the message today on the air, if we go off there at 12, which we probably will, then we have the complete message on cassette tape. If we have to run over a few minutes past 12. We will have it on the cassette tape here. And you in the radio listen audience, if you are right in, you can get the complete message on the cassette tape. If you don't get it all on the air. Now you keep that in mind. That stands true to every Sunday morning that we tape our Sunday morning program. Now you turn to the book of Ruth, page 315, in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I'm greatly disturbed about the crime wave in America. I heard last week about in Dallas, Texas, it increased 40% in the past year. And there have so many people that's involved in crime that the prisons and the jails are completely filled and they have nowhere to put the criminals or the lawbreakers. That's in Dallas. Now it's going to get that way all over America. Now one reason for that is because of these liberal crime-loving, venal judges that overturn these death penalty cases, bring about these new trials, and the taxpayer has to pay that expense for the new trials, and these crime-loving liberal judges care nothing about the victim or their families. They're concerned about uh, being bribed or listened to some crooked lawyer and getting new trials out of these people that's already sentenced to death. Now you must remember this, that the death penalty has not been rescinded. God gave it in the book of Genesis, and it's all the way through the Bible. It's cold-blooded murder. He's to be punished. Now God didn't stop there. God said, I'll tell you how he's to be punished. God said he's to be punished by paying with his life. God's never changed that. Some of these know-it-all judges and lawyers and liberals and uh, members of the America's Crime Levin Union or Cranky Lunatic Union or whatever it is that oppose capital punishment, they think they know more than God. But they're going to soon learn how foolish they are when this land is so filled with criminals until you have to take a gun in your pocket or in your hands when you leave your house or when you go to town. Now that time is coming. I don't see why the Attorney General doesn't send a committee to the state of Georgia and investigate some of these judges that's overturning these cases, especially this crowd in Atlanta. They need to be investigated. There's something wrong, something bad wrong. I know they hate the death penalty because they love the criminals. But there's something deeper than that. And they need to be investigated. And we have many judges in Georgia that needs to be investigated. That Those three stooges that overturned the conviction of the thugs that killed the All Day family. They most certainly ought to be investigated. And these judges overturning these death penalties ought to have to help pay for these new trials. And if they do that, and some of the crooked lawyers that advocate these things ought to have to have pay for it, they'll stop this foolishness. Now, we need some politicians to rise up and get off their premises 
and do something about this. We elect politicians, we send them to Atlanta, we send them to Washington, and they sit around and let these judges and lawyers get by with this kind of stuff. And the law-abiding citizens and people that are supporting this nation financially and try to do what's right has to suffer. And something ought to be done about it. The American people are sick and tired of it. 86% of the people in America are for the death sentence, death penalty. They're for it. And yet you have these few know-it-alls that know more than God and know more than the Bible. They think they have the answer and they're dead wrong. And it's high time that the people that pay the bills and abide by the law speak out and let's get something done about this. I'm sick and tired of it. It's not right. It's absolutely not right. It's not right to let these liberal infidel judges and lawyers run over the law-abiding citizens in this country. Oh, you say, preach Evers, I don't like it. I don't care if you don't like it. You can lump it, lick it, leave it, or whatever you want to do. It's the truth anyhow. And if you'll be honest, you'll have to admit it's true. And the death penalty has never been rescinded. God gave it. And God expects us to do something about that. And when a person commits cold-blooded murder... If he's not put to death, there's something wrong. We're violating the word of God. We're not doing what God said in this book. And as far as that jaybird over in Germany, and those Germans saying they'll send that man that killed that poor sailor on that um, a plane here a year or so ago, they say they'll send him back to America if we won't put him to death. Now that's ridiculous. Beloved, that's ludicrous. We need to realize that if that man is sent back to America, he ought to be punished and treated like he treated that young sailor, and then he ought to be put to death. And those Germans should not ask us not to put him to death. We're saving them from the Russians over there. We went over there and delivered um, uh, the, the Germans of West Germany, defeated West Germany and helped France, those other nations. And now we've put them back on their feet, and they want to tell us what we can do in America, and that's not right. You ought to send that bird back over here and put him to death. Punish him and put him to death. That's exactly what ought to be done. Now, you better believe what I'm saying because I have the word of God and common sense to back me up. That's not my message. But you turn to Ruth uh, chapter 1. In the book of Ruth chapter 1, we find in the beginning of verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. Ought to return from falling after thee, for where thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people should be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, but all but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfast and minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they when they came to Bethlehem, all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mirah, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Now Sunday, the last Sunday, last Sunday, and Sunday before, we dealt with the first verses here, a few verses in this chapter. We gave you the meaning of these names, and I won't have time to review very much and then be able to get my message out today. But we found out last Sunday that the chastening rod of God had fallen upon Naomi. Naomi is a beautiful type of Israel. We'll bring a full message on that before we finish the series. But we find she's a type of a person that disobeying God or backsliding on God. She and her husband and her two sons went down into Moab. And there they ended up in the washed pot in Moab. We find that Naomi was washed out. And uh, washed up rather. And Ophel was washed out and Ruth was washed in. In the pot down there in Moab. Moab being God's wash pot. And then the chastening rod of God fell upon Naomi. She buried her husband. 
She buried her two sons. God gave her no grandsons. And there she was alone down there, having buried her family in a cursed land. Now she realizes that something must be done. Her heart is breaking. She's coming to herself. And Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the house of bread. It's a place where the bread of life was born. There in the little city of Bethlehem. In March of this year, the Lord willing, I plan to make my 13th trip to Bethlehem. Beautiful place. I plan to see the shepherd's field and the place where Ruth gleaned in the field of Boaz. Some of you in the radio listening audience sort ought of to plan to go with me on this tour. You ought to write in and get a brochure. Time is running out for you to get your name on the list. What a wonderful trip it is. But anyway, we plan to see this particular place where Ruth is gleaning in the field of Boaz and to see beautiful Bethlehem. Now, she decided to go back. She could not forget the land of blessings. Like the prodigal son, she came to herself. Now, when a person backslides on God... And begins to disobey God. Become disobedient. You're not going to get them back to God. Until they come to themselves. And God knows exactly how to bring that about. And God will bring that about. In due time. If you're backslidden on God. She heard that God had visited her land. The land of Judea. Right there in Bethlehem. The place the house of bread. They shouldn't have left there in the first place. They left there and, of course, went into Moab. God told them to stick by, confess their sins, face Jerusalem and pray, and he would send the rain and take care of them. But we find Elimelech, Naomi, Marlon, and Kilion left that land and came into Moab, a cursed land, a land that God had placed a curse upon and said the people could enter into the congregation of the Lord for ten generations. And there they went to abode, to abide rather they abode there in that particular land, and Naomi leaves three graveyards containing her husband and two sons in a cursed land where they should have been buried there. Machpelah and Hebron are there near Bethlehem. But she leaves them in that cursed land and she's ready to go back. Now she had to come back to the place where she was willing to come to the place where she's willing to go back. She had to be made willing. She spent some nine or ten years there which speaks of testimony and judgment. And she had a testimony to give when she came back. And it was a judgment of God that drove her back to Bethlehem. Now notice the decision of Ophir and Ruth. Now they both went out a certain distance with, with Naomi. And then uh, Naomi insisted they go back to their people. And live among their people and serve their God. Chemoth. Beth, Beth Peor. And... Uh, Others there, the wicked gods they had there in the land of Moab. And she said, you go back to your family. I can't have any more sons. If I could have sons, would you tarry until they were grown and marry them? You better go back to your people. And so Ruth said, well, I'll go with you. But Naomi said, I'll go back to my people. And we find Brother, a Brother Ophir. Ophir said to Naomi, I'll go back to my people. And then we find that Ophir kissed her mother-in-law Naomi, turned her back upon her, and went back to her people. She fades away in oblivion. You hear nothing more about Ophir. She disappears back to her people and to her gods. But we find Ruth here, which is a type of a sinner coming to God, which also is a type of the church as we see further along in the book of Ruth. She says to Naomi, I want to go back with you. Now Naomi said, it grieves me, it grieves me that you're in this condition, that you've lost your husband. It grieves me that my husband died. It was a grief unto Naomi that her daughters-in-laws suffered along with her because of her disobedience. You don't backslide on God without others suffering along with you. Your family or your friends or relatives or others suffer. And Naomi was grieved greatly because of the situation. But Ruth said, I want to go back with you to your people. And I notice there's seven things here that she wanted. This is very beautiful. These are beautiful words. They're used in psalms and poems and prose and whatnot. 
And yet they were spoken to her mother-in-law. Very beautiful, beautiful indeed. Notice what she said. Now she was determined, first of all, uh, to go back with her. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined, steadfastly unmoved, determined to go back with her, she said, all right, you may come along. Now notice what Ruth said to her mother-in-law. Number one, she said, whither thou goest, I will go. Would you be willing to go where God wants you to go? Whither thou goest, I will go. She said that to Naomi. Ruth did. Secondly, she said, where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Where you make your home is where my home will be. I want to be with you, Naomi. I want to be with you in Bethlehem, Judah. You've told us much about that blessed land. You've told us about your God, Jehovah. And I want to lodge where you lodge. And then she said, thy people shall be my people. Oh, when you get right with God, then God's people become your people. God's people are the greatest people in the world. I learned that when I got saved. I cared nothing about being around them until I got saved. And when God saved me, that's been my crowd. They're the greatest people in the world. I can hardly wait on Sunday morning to come here to this church and see God's people and fellowship and sing and pray and preach. I look forward to it every Lord's day. She said, then thy people shall be my people. So when you get saved, you start associating with God's people. The Bible tells you to do that. Then number three, we find, a uh, number four, rather, she said, Thy God shall be my God. Thy God shall be my God. If I go back with you, Naomi, then your God will be my God. Not the God of the Moabitish people, Chemos, Baal Peor, but she said, your God will be my God. If you come to know God, then the, the God of God's children will be your God, the God of heaven. I remember hearing about Hammond Alpha many years ago when God so greatly used him in the early years of his evangelism. He's out here in Texas and he was a Jew. And whenever he surrendered to preach and attend the seminary, go out in evangelism, they disowned him. His mother and dad owned a great business in the north. And they were getting old. And they decided that he would, his dad would go back and see if he could talk Hammond and coming back and taking over the business and stop that preaching business. He rode all the way to Texas and to see his son, Hammond. And he said, Hammond, I'm getting old. We have a great business back home. Your mother is very feeble. She's not going to be here long. Son, won't you come back and be with us in our last days? We need you back home. We need our son to take over our business. Won't you please come back? And for a couple of weeks, he stayed and begged Hammond to go back home and stop the preaching business and take over their business. Hammond said, Daddy, I can't do it. God has saved me. God has called me to preach. I can't do it, Daddy. And whenever his daddy, or time came for him to go back home, Hammond followed him to the train, stepped up on the step and hugged his daddy's neck and kissed him on the cheek, said, Daddy, I love you. I may never see you alive again, but I want you to know I love you. Daddy, tell Mama I love her. I love my mother, but said, Daddy, I want you to tell her, and I want to tell you, I love Jesus Christ more than anybody in this world. And I can't turn my back on him. He saved me and called me to preach. Goodbye, Daddy. Tell Mama goodbye. And he walked away to preach the gospel. Dear people, when you come to know God, there may come a time in your life when your relatives, your kin people, your friends will try to keep you from going all the way with God and try to keep you from serving God, but you must pay that price. Jesus said, unless we love fa father and mother, love God more than father and mother, brother, sister, unless we wouldn't forsake father and mother, brother and sister, we're not worthy to carry the gospel. Jesus Christ must come first. If you have to give up your parents or your children or even your companion turns against you, you better stick with Jesus Christ. You better go with God. That's what Jesus said in the Bible. 
And he said, he'll bless you. And he'll give you uh, fathers, mothers, fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters more than you had in the past. And that he will do. And she went on to say, where thou diest, will I die. She said, Naomi, where you die, that's where I want to die. I'm willing to go back and die with God's people. John Wesley said, my people die well. God's people die well. I want to go back, Naomi. I don't want to die here in this heathen country. I don't want to die among the Moabitish people. I want to go back and die where you die. Jehovah is your God. And now he's my God. And then she said, not only that, Naomi, but where you are buried, I want to be buried. I don't want to be buried here in the land of Moab beside Marlon. I want to go back and be buried beside you, Naomi, back in the land of God. I want to go there and remain there until I die. Then she said not only that, but she said, where you're buried, I want to be buried. I want to go back and die where you died. I want to die on your bed where you died. I want to be buried where you're buried. I want them to bury me beside you, Naomi. Don't bring my body back to Moab. I know Marlon is buried here. I know my father-in-law is buried here. I know my brother-in-law is buried here. But bury me, bury me in the land of God. Bury me in Bethlehem, Judea. Bury me, Naomi, where you are buried. That's what I want. And then she went on to say, finally, only death can part us. She said, Naomi, my sweet mother-in-law, you've been good to me. You've been wonderful to me. And my people has been good to me. But said, there's not a thing in the world going to separate me from you but death. That's fine. I'm going to stick with you until I die. And the only thing that will ever separate us will be death. Oh, beloved, she meant business. And when you come to the place where you mean business with God, and only death can stop you. Then you're in pretty good shape for God to use you as you sojourn. Now notice it was, it was in the plan of God that Ruth find grace. That Ruth find peace. That Ruth find rest. Now she's a type of sinner, number one. She's a type of the church, number two. The bride of Christ to be. And then she found grace. When she decided to go back to Bethlehem, Judah, she found grace. Wonderful, marvelous grace. And then she found peace. Wonderful, wonderful peace in Bethlehem. And then she found rest in the land of Bethlehem. Oh, what she found was wonderful. That's exactly what every sinner finds when they come to know God. They find God's grace is sufficient. They find they have peace with God. They have peace of heart and mind. And then they find rest in the Lord. The Bible said there is a rest for the people of God. My peace I give unto you, said the Lord Jesus. You can find grace. You can find peace. You can find rest. I may be speaking to someone out in the radio listening to this right now. You're troubled. You out drinking, cursing last night. You did some wicked things last night or last week. You have the headache this morning. You've been fussing with your companion. You've been fussing on your children. What you need is God. God can solve your problem. God can save you. God can give you peace of mind, heart, and soul. God can straighten out your family. And God can straighten out your life. You ought to fall down on your knees right there with that radio. And say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And save me for Jesus' sake. And God will do it. He certainly will if you mean business. Now, what the law cannot do, grace can do. We're not saved by law, we're saved by grace. Grace can do it. Now, notice what happened here. Ruth is a type of sinner, she's a type of the church. Now, we had six down in Moab. Six is the number of the world. Elimelech, Naomi, Marlon, Kilion, Ruth, and Ophir. You have the six, a type of the world, one short of perfection. But now, we have two on the road back to Bethlehem. Quite significant. Have two on the road to Bethlehem. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. We have going back toward Bethlehem, the dear old lady in Naomi. She aged now the ten years she was in Moab. And now she has a beautiful, lovely, Moabitess woman walking by her side. 
and they're walking together. We find in the Bible where two men were walking down the road to Emmaus. They were talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And the Son of God joined them and said, what are you talking about? They said, haven't you heard? They have crucified Jesus and, and they buried him. And they said he's risen again or going to rise again on a certain day. And said, haven't you heard that? And the Bible said Jesus opened up the Psalms in the Bible and told them all the prophecy pertaining to him that he was to be crucified. And later on when they found it was Jesus telling them that, they said, did not our heart burn within us as he talked with us by the way? You have the two going down the road to Emmaus. You have two prophets crossing over Jordan, Elijah and Elisha. That's a type of the spirit-filled life. They talked about the crucifixion and resurrection on the road to Emmaus. These people are talking about a double portion of God's spirit. And Elisha wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And he got that. After you're saved, you need a double portion of the spirit of God. We find two others walking together by the name of God and Enoch. Oh, they're talking about heaven. And that's a type of the rapture. Can two walk together unless they agree? And Enoch walked with God and the Bible said he went on to spend the day with God. And there's no night there. So he's still spending the day with God. Two walking together. How wonderful. The way of the transgressor is hard. Naomi had a hard life in Moab. They had transgressed. And now they're going back to Bethlehem. It's going to be wonderful. When we get into chapters 2, 3, and 4. And find out what happened. Now notice they arrived in Bethlehem. At the beginning of barley harvest. Now the Jews have been exiled to bring in the church, of course, it tells us in Romans. And now she had been exiled there, Moab, uh, Naomi had in, in the land of Moab to bring back Ruth, which is a type of the church. Because of the Jews being cut off, the church has been grafted in. Because of Naomi died in Moab, the church, a type in Ruth, has been brought to back to Bethlehem, Judea. And Naomi there, as she enters into Bethlehem, She's exactly where the Jews are today, prophetically speaking, going back home, going back home like Naomi of old. And the people in Jerusalem, I've seen them stand there and gaze at Tel Aviv Airport, watching for the people to come. And they're saying, I wonder if that's so-and-so from Russia, from America. Are these our people coming in? And when Naomi came back into Bethlehem, they said, is this Naomi? They hardly knew her. Verse 19 said they hardly knew her. They came back in the beginning of barley harvest. First of all, there's barley. Then there's flax. And then there's wheat. And the barley is the beginning of the harvest. They came back in a good time. And the barley harvest speaks of the new beginning. It speaks of their first love. It speaks of coming where God can take care of you with barley. And then, of course, um, the other part of the grain, the flax and the wheat. And they came back in time of barley harvest. It speaks of a new beginning. It speaks of revival. It speaks of the first love that you have for God when you come to know Jesus. And they came back in the heart of new Naomi, verse 19. The whole town turned out and said, is this Naomi? They began to question her. Maybe one lady said, Naomi, I remember when you got married. Where is Elimelech? Maybe others said, Naomi, I used to help take care of your little boy Marlon. Where is he? Maybe another said, uh, Naomi, how about Kilion? Always loved that child. The old rabbi may have come out and said, I remember when I circumcised those boys. Where are they? And Naomi could hardly answer. Oh, she said, don't call me Naomi, the pleasant one. I went away full as the pleasant one. Don't call me Naomi, the pleasant one anymore. Oh, she said, God has brought me back empty. I've been emptied. God brought me back like the prodigal son went away full. A little money in his pocket. He came home empty. Oh, she said, I come back empty. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mirah, which means bitterness. She said, because of what I've gone through, I've been embittered. Oh, I've been embittered because I lost my husband. I lost my two sons. I wasted 10 years in Moab. We made this terrible mistake and I've become bitter about the thing. It says, don't call me the pleasant one. Call me the embittered one because I went away full. 
went away full and God brought me back empty. So they came in the beginning of barley harvest, speaking of the first love, speaking of joy, speaking of a revival. And that's exactly what can happen to every child of God that comes to know God, or comes back into fellowship with God. Here in the book of Ruth is book number eight in the Bible, which speaks of new beginning. It's between the book of Judges and the book of Kings. I mean uh, Samuel, first Samuel. There in the book of Judges, there was no king. Everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. And they did uh, what they wanted to do until they came to the place. What they did is not what they really loved to do. And then God gives us the book of Ruth, a book of new beginning. You have in this book four chapters. You have 85 verses. You have 2,578 words. You have 16 questions. You have 30 commands and two promises in this wonderful book of Ruth. How marvelous is the word of God. How wonderful is God's word that he gives us to feed upon and meditate upon. Now I want you to think about these things as you sojourn today. What a beautiful picture. These things can be applied to our bare hearts today if we're willing to do so. i let it be done. God bless you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father in heaven, today I pray that you speak to every heart in this building. I pray, dear God, that you speak to the entire radio listening audience. I pray, dear God, that somebody will be saved as a result of this broadcast today and somebody will be revived and someone will be brought back into fellowship in the beginning of barley harvest and that thy people will be blessed in general. And we thank you for what you do. In Christ's name, amen. Now as Tracy plays a couple of stanzas, listen to me. If you're in this building and you need to get saved, you come down here. If you want to come back to God, come on down here. Let us help you back to Bethlehem, Judea. Now is the beginning of barley harvest as far as you're concerned, if you want it to be. Or if you want to unite with this church, or come forward to this altar for any reason, you may do so. Would you come? Would you obey God while we wait? We'll give you ample time to respond if you come. God has spoken to your heart would you come while brother Tony praise our brother here that's come anybody else why wait Martin's friends over here with them. Appreciate them coming. Appreciate all of you coming. God bless you.